Well, thank you for this opportunity. I've uh, talked to several loaded clubs back in Texas, but this is my first club in, in Western Australia. I want to thank uh, Stan Shure for coming and uh, videoing this, and also uh, Brian Herman. Brian is the co-founder of the Flyers Club, which is a group of mainly World War II veterans, and most of them British that flew bombers out of Britain. And uh, I made this talk to them about a month ago, and the club wanted to get it on video, so they picked you fellas as the victims. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm what the radical element in the Middle East calls an infidel. And I'd like to say that you bet I'm an infidel and a damn proud citizen of the best two countries in the world, Australia and the United States. My presentation today is only the second time I've ever talked about World War II. I've shared for the past year some great meetings with these World War II pilots and all their exploits, and I wanted them to know who took the islands where they built the air bases so they could fly their damn airplanes. So anyway, that's how I told me to put together this presentation. Six years ago, Nazi Germany had overrun almost all of Europe and hammered England to the verge of bankruptcy and defeat. It sunk more than 400 British ships and convoys carrying food and war materials between England and America. Then December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor. I can remember my family gathering around the Philco radio to hear President Roosevelt declare December 7, 1941, a day of infamy the day the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor. But you know, Prime Minister Churchill, he took a different view. He said, being saturated and satiated with emotion and sensation, I went to bed and slept the sleep of the saved and thankful. This is the U.S. Air owner going down in, in, uh, in Pearl Harbor. I grew up in West Texas and Judge Roy Beans all west of the Pecos country. On the day of Pearl Harbor, my good buddies Carol Blythe and Richard Owens uh, joined me down at the Rexall Drug uh, to talk about Pearl Harbor. We knew it wasn't east of, of uh, uh, west of El Paso, or east of El Paso, it must be west out near California. Obviously, we didn't know much geography. And we were all three just destined to learn it the hard way. At the time of Pearl Harbor, my three brothers were 18, 20, and 22. They were among the first to volunteer for the Navy. I was 16 and didn't intend on being left too far behind. I've seen the film Dive Bomber starring Errol Flynn, and, and as a result, developed a game plan. I'd slip off, hitchhike to Dallas, and join the Marines. I'd be a tail gunner on a torpedo plane, a war hero, medals and all. I could just see me in helmet, goggles, a leather jacket, and a white scarf. Oh man, I thought the girls would come running. I hitchhiked to Dallas, lied about my age, and joined up. The troop train headed for California. My dad met the train in Sweetwater. In no uncertain terms, he told the Marine recruiting sergeant I was going home. I was 16, and old for no oath, three sons in the service was enough. Besides, I had chores to do. <laughs> Back in the library, my dog David and I did some tall thinking. It took me a year to convince Dad. I walked to the end of the lane, and David followed it, caught the school bus, with David sitting by the road forlornly watching as the bus disappeared. I was sworn in a year after Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1942. In a San Diego boot camp, we were given an aptitude test. I guess the military thought I was too valuable to be a tail gunner, so they drafted me into the hospital corps. I graduated 81st in a class of 480. Since I couldn't be a tail gunner, I volunteered for service with the Marines. 
I soon deduced that the Marine made it so damn tough on you, when you got into combat, you wanted to take it out on someone. It was something like this Western song. I beg your pardon. I didn't promise you a road guard. We were put through yet another school. I graduated fourth in a class of 83. The 34th replacement battalion was to join the 3rd Marine Division of Guadalcanal. The battalion included 80 corpsmen who were to join various regiments. The night before shipping out, I took out an ex-schoolmate, a 20th century movie started, we jitterbugged at the Palladium in L.A. to Les Brown and his band of renown. She later became known as the first Lois Lane of, Super, of Superman movie and television fame. Once on Guadalcanal, uh, once on we were given a beer ration. I was a Baptist and didn't drink beer. Methodists did that. I met Aussie's Diggers, Smitty and, and uh, Digger and Smitty, and being real curious about down under, they agreed to tell me about Australia if I'd give them a beer ration. So we did. <laughs> I figured they must have been a Methodist. That's, that's where I got Australian food. Although Japan uh, controlled the big hump of the Pacific, by mid-1942, we figured being invincible, non-destructive, 18, 19, and 20 year olds, they'd think they'd plowed up a snake before we got through with it. We were to grow up in a few short months. Sacred to a Marine is the Marine Creed, my rifle. I was to learn it the hard way. I had a Sunday off, so went swimming there on in the Metapola River there on the canal. I was walking along the road when a command car pulled up ahead of me. And out stopped, out stepped Admiral Bull Halsey. I couldn't believe my eyes. I snapped to attention. And the, uh, the Admiral said, what's your rifle number, son? I don't know, sir. My voice was changing about that time. <laughs> and he said, follow me. So I followed his command for a long time into the company headquarters. The Admiral fell out of his car hollering, Colonel, Colonel. Colonel Rogers came, came running out of his tent. He pointed to, the Admiral pointed at me and said, this man doesn't know his rifle hunter. The Colonel looked at me like I slapped my grandmother. Get your combat on, get your combat gear on and report back on the door. Yes, sir. I weighed nine stone in my gear, including my rifle, seven stone. I was put on a parade ground, told to walk 10 paces, present arms and say, this is my rifle. This is my best friend. Its serial number is 152076. And then I'd walk another 10 paces and present arms and say, this is my rifle. It is my best friend. Its serial number is 152076. I did that until I passed out. If any of you fellas want to learn a rifle number, see bullet holes. The U.S. had cracked the code of the Japanese, but unbeknownst to them, we were reading their mail, knew their game plan, every movement. Japanese Admiral Yamamoto of Tora Tora movie fame was traveling in a bomber over, well, I got a little quick there, uh, the Solomon Islands. 18 P-38 fighters were scrambled and shot down his bomber near Bogenville in the Solomon Islands. In the early 40s, the Air Force challenged manufacturers to come up with a bomber with a speed of 400 miles per hour. A range of more than 5,300 miles and the capability of carrying a bomb load weighing 2,000 pounds for at least half that distance. Boeing came up with the B-29 Superfortress, which spanned 141 feet 3 inches from the wingtip to wingtip and measured 99 feet from nose to tail. Its 27 foot 9 inch tail was as tall as a three-story building. A total of 2,513 would be manufactured. Its capabilities meant the Marianas Islands would put our bombers within 1,500 miles of Tokyo. It, take, it dictated Guam as our next target. Operation Forger <coughs> consisted of an armada of 535 ships, including the combat vessels of Task Force 58 
and troop ships carrying 127,500 of us. We converged on the Marianas Islands. It was the greatest invasion in the Pacific thus far. The Japanese fleet of nine carriers with 460 planes and 56 combat vessels sailed from the Philippines in an attempt to stop us, or as a cowboy would say, head us off to pass. Vice Admiral Ozawa commanded from the new carrier, the Tahoe. Logies were picked up on radar approaching the U.S. fleet in several large groups. Fighter Squadron 58 scrambled in its F-6, F-3 Hellcats. The Hellcat was built specifically to counter the Japanese Zero. 426 Japanese aircraft were destroyed. We lost 29 planes, with 16 pilots and 22 crewmen saved. The aircraft carrier Tahoe, which was Japanese, the Japan's uh, greatest carrier, was sunk. It was the most lopsided air battle in World War II and dubbed the Marianas Turkey Shoot. It was a crushing blow to the to the Japanese, which ensured our invasion of the Marianas. We had dodged a bullet. Although we, we were Navy corpsmen, we had lived, breathed, and trained with our company. We were as close as family. Because of this bonding, corpsmen had sustained a greater percentage of casualties <coughs> taking too many chances to save a buddy. The Japs figured killing the corpsmen was worth several Marines. So just before hitting Wall, the third shuffled us about, taking me from 1st Battalion and putting me in field headquarters. We hit Wall on July the 21st, 1944. I was about to learn where, where such expressions as scared shitless came from. The 1st Battalion 3rd led the attack on the center of the Japanese line. This was the strongest point of their defenses. This was my former company, my buddies I trained with for months. All were lost on that first day of action. A son once asked me, were you in the first wave? I had to say no. I should have been. Not being with my buddies left me with a feeling of guilt. I feel and reflect on it to this day. One was as tough as it was. Heavy fire on the beach for the first three or four days. Progress in them was damn slow. About five days into the campaign, the Japanese pulled one of their famed banzai attacks. We killed over 2,000 of them that one night. And frogs, big suckers. At night, if you it sounded like a horde of Japs coming at you. Many a round of ammunition blew frogs the kingdom come. It caused me to learn and value something pilots with their relief tubes never had to think about. Their foreskin. That rascal played a key role in my survival. Laying in a foxhole at night, you'd, work, you'd risk your neck if you stood up to take a leap. We had a few get shot from doing so. No problem. I'd hold the end of my foreskin, fill her up, let it soak in the soil. Later, after marriage and five sons, I was circumcised. I wanted to tan my foreskin and hang it over the fireplace. But my wife wouldn't have a bar. She just, she just couldn't comprehend what we'd been through together. Once on patrol, we'd passed up. And, 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 and by the way, remember that war, my war hero in Metal's dream? When that first Jap bullet went over, I gave that away. Once on patrol, we passed a house except, uh, and vacant except for a record player and a stack of records. I thought, boy, howdy. Tex Ritter, Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, and even Bean Crowley. Now, a guy in my platoon was named Bobo. Only what the now, I'd go to the outdoor movie and Bobo would have me a suit to sit on. He was always banging ears. He was so afraid of being shot, an old doc wouldn't be there to save him. The Sarge called a rest stop on the way back so I could get the record player and records. It was about 20 yards uh, down a jungle path to the house. I stepped into the living room and to face four Japs, one with a rifle across his knees skinning a lizard, another peeling a banana. I wheeled, breaking for the door, 
hollering, Jeff, Jeff, jump behind a log, I cut down a log. Well, here comes a platoon with Bobo yelling, I'm coming back, I'm coming. With that, he pulls the pin on a grenade, lobbing it into the house, blowing the record player and records to smithereen. When I discovered what he'd done, I said, Bobo, you son of a bitch. I hope you get shot and I'm going to stand in what you got. In 21 days, we wiped out 18,000 Japanese. We lost 1,700 men with 16,000 wounded. A hometown buddy, Bobby McCracken, too, sorry, was killed in action and was awarded the nation's second highest honor for valor, the Navy Cross. Good buddy, Spieth, Grisham fought the farm. Forrest and Livingston was wounded. Lieutenant Oliver, my replacement Bartello, and the entire company was lost. Our third Marine regiment was the recipient of the presidential unit citation. If any of you here have sons or daughters in high school age wanting to quit school, let me share with you what it cost me. Once Guam was secure, Corman and the division took a test to select one to return to the University of Texas for a degree in medicine. Because of my combat experience, I was told I'd make a good surgeon. I scored the highest in the division and was elated. I was going home. My commanding officer advised we needed to contact my high school and get my transcript of grade sent to, to the university. Sir, when I joined the service, I lacked six weeks finishing high school. Instead of home, it meant I was destined to take part in the bloodiest battle in U.S. Marine Corps history. Within weeks, Navy CBs and Army engineers on Guam hacked off, hacked out and paved three mile long runways where there had been palm trees and jungles. Even before the dirt scraper and concrete mixers had finished, B-29s flew their first missions from the bases on Guam. The bomb run in Japan was no milk run. It was, at best, a dangerous and fatiguing mission. It claimed heavy losses, casualties so severe that they could not be sustained for long. Iwo Jima was the same for the main region. From the Marianas to Japan, 750 miles, squarely athwart the only direct path to targets. Crippled B-29s trying to get home were easy targets. The 3rd, 4th, and Marine Divisions had their next target. We hit the Iwo Jima on February the 19th, 1945. 78,000 of us, it's 22,000 Japanese, fought on 8 square mile Iwo Jima. Unlike other campaigns, there was no defense on the beach and no suicide attacks. Kiribati, their commander, had built a network of tunnels and underground bunkers. That's Mount Suribachi there in the background. And you, you can see all of the trees and vegetation we had to hide behind there. There were underground bunkers that were, that were so extensive that the Japanese army was able to fight us entirely underground. There were hidden interior positions dug into strategic locations throughout the island especially in Mount Suribachi, some 1,500 rooms connected by miles of tunnels accessible through 5,000 pillboxes and caves. Underground hospitals included a hospital, a sauna, and a seven-story structure. Now, that structure was in, that, in Mount Suribachi, that seven stories. And they were used for stockpiling, for stockpiling weapons, ammunition, radios, fuel, and rations. From their fortified positions on Mount Suribachi, Japanese gunners had a clear view of every bit of our landing areas, which were also flanked by blockhouses and pillboxes. There were no front lines. We rarely saw a living Japanese soldier. We had to take them out with flamethrowers and satchel charging. There's your flamethrower working. One of the three of us were either killed or wounded. 28,686 in all, 500 the first day. The narrow dead Jap did we see. They were stacking them, they were stacking their casualties like cardwood and tunnels. 
20, 36 days, we wiped out about 22,000. This would be the only battle in the Pacific where the invaders suffered more casualties than the defenders. Corman losses in, numbered in the hundreds. I was one of 83 of 80 corpsmen from the 3rd replacement, the 34th replacement battalion that served with the 3rd. To the best of my knowledge, 18 of us made it home. Only two were not wounded in action. I was one of them. Admiral Chester Nimitz, commander of the war in the Pacific, said of Iwo Jima, uncommon valor was a common virtue. While fighting on Iwo raids, the 13th day, uh, I'll get ahead of myself, while fighting raids on Iwo on the 13th day of the invasion, the first emergency landings were made, and landing the B-29 wound up on the Japanese controlled end of the runway. He spun around and came hustling back. 34 days later, T-51 Mustangs and F-61 Black Widows flew their first escort mission to Japan, and nine days later began flying fighter sweeps in search of energy. An aircraft with other targets, as many as the 1,000 B-29s, were hit Japan for one raid. You know, that's when I entered the pilots with their relief tubes. They were doing it over Tokyo what I'd always wanted to do. Now, taking off from Guam, you could feel the island shudder. The sun was blocked out. It was an awesome sight. Just think about it. From a 1940 drawing, drawing board to 1,000 B-29s over Tokyo in less than five years. Many of the bomber crew were saved from vision at sea with 402 pilots plucked from the Pacific Ocean, 2,400 bombers carrying 27,000 crew had made unscheduled landing on Iwo Jima. We were back in training for the invasion of Japan. We were set to invade Kaishu on November the 1st, 45, and Honshu on March the 1st, 46. President Truman was advised we would have seven more atomic bombs ready before we, before we invaded. The plan blanket the Japanese uh, just prior to our landing. Japan had two million home island soldiers well prepared against the invasion. U.S. intelligence forecast losses of upwards of 800,000, and the Japanese would have lost millions. And in hindsight, if the bullet didn't get you, ignorance of the danger of fallout from those seven atomic bombs would have been the death knell for every one of us participating. Think about it. If any of you here today had a father slated to take part and we had hit Japan, odds are you might never have been born. The President Truman showing guts and foresight had the LJ drop the first atomic bomb. Hirohito was a sole owner, so then a second bomb. Hirohito threw in the towel even though Japanese army elements attempted to thwart surrender. Thank God Hirohito realized the job. A lawyer friend of mine, formerly an aircraft carrier pilot, sent me a book entitled Flags of Our Fathers. It was written by a son of a corpsman who was one of the six raising the flag on Hewell's Mount Suribachi. His accompanying note read, This book brought tears. What a sacrifice of wonderful youth to what bravery. I responded, February 19th is the anniversary of the Evo. Evo gave us Corbin one hell of a workout. It was the first battle in which we had blood for transfusion, penicillin to fight infections. I was on the USS Frederick Thompson, loaded with casualties for the return to Guam. The ship commanded by Captain Anderson. His son, a Marine Sergeant, was brought aboard just before we sailed. Both arms and legs had been blown off by a mortar. He joked about what a damn mess he was. We kept him alive for 16 hours. Then his dad signed his death certificate. We had a great number with every type of wound, amputation of limbs from gas gangrene, those with punctured lungs hopeless. All we could do was to make them comfortable and wait for them to die. I always thank God on February 19th, and remember some mighty tall guys. After getting the book, Flags of Our Fathers, 
I read it right through. Couldn't put it down. So many parallels with what my buddies and I had experienced. Like my friend, I cried too. I got home in November, in November 1946. Caught the school bus to the farm from home. As I stepped off the bus, there was my dog David jumping up and down and wagging his tail. I broke it up. My grandmother said it was the first time he'd been out in play since I left. In closing, I want to share a few facts with you in today's world, which perhaps are new to you. The Iraq war so far has cost the U.S. about $160 million, which is roughly what 9-11 cost New York. It also has cost over 2,200 American lives, which is roughly two-thirds of that hope that the Jihad sucked out of 9-11. World War II cost the U.S. about $12 trillion, but the cost of not fighting and winning World War II would have been an unimaginable greater. A world dominated by German and Japanese Nazism. World War I and II were supposed to be the worst end of wars. Now we are back at it. Some want to appease by pulling out of the Middle East. They are too young to remember Hitler and the Japanese and how in Europe appeasement was tried. And the Pope recently quoted history, which told it like it is. Good on the Pope. We have to face up to the fact that jihadis believe that Islam should own and control the Middle East first, then Europe, and then the world. Any not bound to their will must be killed, enslaved, or sub subjugated. The world purged it. Of Jews. This is their mantra, and we infidels have no place in it. Unfortunately, too many of us just don't get it. We, we are, if we are to maintain our way of life, our standards, our freedoms, we have to deal with Islamic terrorism until we defeat it. Prime Minister Churchill wants to find appeasement as someone who feeds the crocodile in the hope of being eat last. Thank God for the leadership of Prime Minister Hyde, Prime Minister Blair, and President Bush. I pray you're listening. It's been, been a real honor. Thank you. <laughs> many were buried in those cemeteries that you saw there after we secured the island. And, and many of them were uh, the ones that died aboard ship going back to Guam. We have the, there's a big cemetery on Guam. Some of the Navy people would want to be buried at sea. But most of the Marines are taken back to either buried there or taken back to Guam. You know, what the, the thing spooky about Iwo is we were getting killed right left and center with wounded and, and we weren't finding any of them dead because they were taking them and hiding back in their tunnels. That Mount Suribachi there, that's where that seven-story hotel was. And uh, it, it gets real spooky. When you're fighting a battle and you're not killing nobody, you know, or you can't prove it. Well, uh, one of my brothers, Pat, he wound up on an aircraft carrier in the Manila Bay. He was a signalman, and he was hit by a, a kamikaze, a Jap suicide plane on the wing, and carried down the flight deck and filled with shrapnel and burn all the hell. And uh, he lived, but he wasn't too fit a man after that, after the war. My other brother we used to have a lot of fun out of him. He he served in the Aleutians and he was on a yard on a minesweeper. And uh, he'd tell us stories about he would get 60 below zero up there and they'd have to chip the ice off the boat to keep it from turning over. And we told him, we said, hell, Bob, you, you're not a veteran of the war. You was a victim. You bet. We had, a, we had what we call the GI Bill of Rights. And after my experience of missing out on medical school, I went, I had, uh, my correspondence had gotten my high school certificate while I was still, while I was still in the service. See, after Iwo Jima, I went on into, uh, uh, the, I, I went back to the Navy and I went into Japan after the, the atomic bomb and I was in China and I served another year. So I finished my high school, my correspondence, and boy, the minute I got out of the service, I took the GI Bill and went to university. Of course, I had to supplement it by working in a bar at night and then a laundry in the morning, but I got through. 
But yeah, Uncle Sam was really good to us. How did you get to Australia, Jack? Sir? How did you get to Australia? Well, uh, I got to Australia, I was, I, I had made quite a name in agriculture and one day the phone rang and Art Lakeletter called me and said that they had investments out here and wanted me to come to Australia and uh, I told my neighbor, he was always kidding me about wanting to make a name in international agribusiness, He's, I figured he was calling or had somebody call. And I told the caller, I said, well, well, yeah, but I'm busy with the president of the U.S. right now. I don't know if I have time to come out to California. They said, no, Mr. Fletcher, we'll have a limousine meet you uh, at the airport if you can come out next Wednesday. And I said, well, you do that, and, and I'll be there. So, hell, it wasn't long before a little girl called me from Brandon Farrell. They said, oh, Mr. Fletcher, we have a first-class ticket for you to go, hey, Mr. Fletcher, do you know our blink letter? I said, I guess I do. Uh, I was in Australia about two weeks later. Then I liked Australia, and it's much like Texas. Uh, in fact, when I came out here 41 years ago, I had a Texas accent. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, I liked it, and I put my own deal together. And for a long time, we we had seven stations in the Kimberleys. We had a, a major interest in a packet plant. We, had a feed, we put in one of the first feed yards in Australia. I was laughed at. I was told the cattle wouldn't eat feed in a feedlot and jump out. Today it's a two and a half billion dollar market for this country. And we had an agency business. In other words, it was totally vertically integrated. We ran 100,000 head of cattle, turned off 37% of all the cattle in the Northwest for 20 years. And then I had a ship sink in the Gulf of Mexico loaded with farm with uh, machinery. We had a tsunami in the Kimberleys that uh, drowned 60,000 head of cattle on the Fitzroy. And just when I couldn't think, I thought things couldn't get any worse, I walked out on the veranda, and here comes Brian Burke and his bandits over the hill. <laughs> and Brian wanted to rid the Yanks of the Kimberleys because he thought I was Charlie Court's show pony. You know, Brian didn't know the difference between a Texan and a Yank. <laughs> so anyway, I've been here for a while. Thank you so much. Would you much. all please put your hands together and thank you. <laughs>